So, I feel like the last few weeks I've been responding during this time of sharing to a lot of people's angst. We have a lot of folks in the community that are feeling hurt or wounded because of whatever might be happening in their life and also from what's happening in our world. And last week, I kind of stepped away from the regular reading of the Torah portion and want to talk about hope. And this week, I'm again stepping away from the typical messages about a Torah portion so I can try and figure out how do you do that? Hope. I talked about last week why it was so important not to let our hope be lost or robbed or taken away or feeling so depleted that, that we just can't do it anymore. We don't see the point. I think by the end of the night, I kind of, I think I won. I think folks were like, okay, Rabbi, I'm with you. But I didn't tell you how to do it, really. How do I share that? How do I, how do I share how to do that with you? I'm hearing from parents and teens alike about how going to school is, is scary. <laughs> how wrong is that? Scary because... There's easy access to weapons in our world, in our country. Scary because another school has been quite literally in the line of fire. Scary because people are, aren't feeling tragedy anymore. Or they're kind of getting used to it. And for me, that's also kind of scary. We just celebrated Passover, Pesach, season of our liberation, and yet I don't totally feel liberated. I feel like there's still a whole lot of chains around us and, and that's weighing us down. And I know that the sun is coming out. The snow thing is a little weird for me still at this time of year, but the sun is coming out again and there's this optimism and everybody's excited to be outside, but there's also kind of a heaviness in our hearts. And Exodus and liberation and Passover is supposed to make us feel a little bit lighter. I think. It's great to get out of Egypt, but I think the journey once we're out is so difficult. We forget that crossing that sea, it wasn't paved roads. There must have been a whole lot of mud and muck, and it was really hard to pick up their feet and keep going and getting through it. And sometimes that's how we feel about life or politics or the world, that there's a whole lot of muck and it's hard to lift up our foot and put one in front of the other and keep on going, knowing that we have a goal of getting toward a promised land. It takes a lot of energy. So if you remember, we all went through those waters. We did get to the other side. Once we were there, there was this oasis of calm. But then we needed another oasis because we were all thirsty. The Torah says that the Israelites really were thirsty and they got to a body of water just after getting through, moments after their freedom, and they started to complain. That's partially what we do, I get it. But they started to complain because the water was bitter. And so this water, this space is called mara. Mara is the word for bitterness. And God instructs Moses to take this wood and throw it into the water. And then all of a sudden, the water became sweet. It's kind of this amazing story in the Torah. It's a little strange. So the commentators, of course, all throughout history, including other academic biblical scholars, are wondering what kind of wood was it? Well, there are certain species of wood that have tannins in it, and maybe that could reduce some of the bitterness. Frankly, I don't really care. It, 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 that, that's not what they're trying to do. Let somebody figure out what kind of wood it was. But we know that throwing in this wood transformed the water from bitter to sweet, and people were able to drink of it again. So one of my teachers, Dr. Norman Cohen, a professor of Midrash at the Hebrew Union College, he taught that the text does not read, Vayerehu eats, which would mean God show, showed Moses a tree. Instead, it says, Vayorehu eats, which actually means God taught him a tree. It's not that God showed a tree and for Moses to take the wood and throw it into the water. The text actually means God taught him a tree. 
So what made the bitter water sweet? God taught Moses a tree. What was the tree? The Eitz Chaim. What's Eitz Chaim? A tree of life. We're not talking about the one in the garden. We're talking about Torah. Torah is the Eitz Chaim, a tree of life. This symbol of something with deep, deep roots and branches that brings forth life and fruit, that's the Eitz Chaim, that's our Torah. Oh, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying if you just study Torah, it's going to fix everything. Uh, some might believe that. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. I'm saying we study in order to learn how to do. It's not just study. Jewish tradition, our framework of mitzvot, it all exists so that we can learn how to repair and restore a broken and fragmented world. So Torah is there to inspire us, to remind us that we have some work to do. So there's a midrash that says Rav, he was such a famous rabbi that all they needed to do is call him rabbi. They didn't need his names. So Rav said, the mitzvot were given only in order that human beings might be purified by them. For what does the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One of Blessing, what, is, what does God really care how a person observes one mitzvah or, or one particular mitzvah or not. God probably doesn't care according to this text. The purpose of it all is to refine us, to help us respond to real life and real world. Why do I make a fuss here about learning Torah? Well, because it's a Jewy thing to do. Yeah, that's true, but it's more than that. I think it's good for us. I think it's good medicine. It brings comfort. And it tells us we're not alone. And we can grow from it. And if we can grow from it, then no matter what comes our way, we are able to handle it. In Pirkei Avot, it says, B'makom she'en anashim, in a place where nobody's acting like a real human being, liot ish. You have to, you have to do your best. You have to stretch, you have to strive in order to be human. Not just another animal, but you have to stretch for it. It's not so easy. So going back to Dr. Cohen, the Eitz Chaim, the Torah, that provides us with Maim Chaim, living, life-giving waters for which each of us searches, that is what we need. The tree, and the waters. So, what do I mean by all of this? Folks who come around know that I've had my fair share of illness or hardship and loss. I've lived at Mara too, a place where those bitter waters have been. I know what it's like to taste of Mara. It's not great, but I also know how to get out from there. Because with that Eitz Chaim and Torah and tradition and mitzvot and a framework of living Jewishly, it has helped me to find comfort and the strength that I believe God has given me, but I needed to find a way to tap into that. I think that was true for the most profound moments of loss and difficulty for me. And I think it's true when we're living with uncertainty today. So what does the Torah teach? Torah teaches us to stretch and to strive, to be our best selves, not to be the most successful self, but to be a self that makes a difference in the world. It's not the success, it's the significance. Success is great, but what really matters is the Torah I can find and then, and then the Torah I get to share. So I think Torah teaches us how to be real human beings, or as our grandparents would say, to be a mensch. Torah teaches me not to be indifferent, not to disappear. Lo tuchal lehit alem. Don't become invisible, indifferent. This week's Torah portion is called Kiddoshim. And if we went from one section of the Torah and rolled from the other section and started rolling all at the same time, we'd end up in the middle. And in the middle, in the middle, it says, Love 
your neighbor as yourself. Now what does that mean? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, if you really think about that, that's kind of difficult to do. We tend to be suspicious of people we don't know. Some of us aren't even that taking good care of ourselves. But if we were to love somebody else as much as we love ourselves, oh my gosh, everything would change, wouldn't it? If you really thought about it? Some understand that you should love your neighbor who is like you. Oh. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor because your neighbor is really a whole lot like you. Well, if you're able to see that, well, then that also changes how we see everyone and everything. Love your neighbor who is like you. Can we turn from numb indifference to seeing someone who is like ourselves, even the one we disagree with? especially the ones we disagree with. Torah is telling us not to keep hate in our hearts because, by the way, it transforms us into a pharaoh. Torah teaches us right in the middle of the whole Torah to love somebody else that you don't know because that person is just like us. So I need love after these school shootings. I need love after attacks on synagogues. I need love when we hear about attacks on people of color, after rockets fall on civilian population centers in Israel. All of these things, I need love, and I need us to figure out how to bring it out. I need that love, and I need you to love too. I need you to love too. <laughs> and if you love, then you can't sit on the sidelines, folks. We have to step forward just a little bit. If we want God to bring peace down, then we have to stand up and speak our truths and model for others what it means to do, to give, to advocate, to cry, to experience grace. So, as the Torah says, Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy because we're supposed to walk in God's ways. God gave the Torah out of love, and we can live out that Torah with love. It's not so easy to do, especially if we haven't been trained to do it all of our lives. We've been trained to go out and make a living. Well, how about we make a life? Let's start there.